I want to begin tonight with a couple of rhetorical questions for you. The first one is this. Why do you do good to others? What's your motivation in blessing other people? Now, you can probably think of a couple of bad answers to that question, a couple of selfish answers, such as we might do good sometimes to others, hoping to receive something good back. I'll scratch your back if you'll scratch mine. We, we do things expecting that down the road when we need a favor, they will return that favor to us. And of course, that's a selfish motivation, not a, a God-pleasing one. Another bad example would be because we have a reputation to keep, that we're looking for uh, people to regard us in a certain character, and so we're going to bless other people so that they will hold us in high esteem. Those are not good reasons to do good to others. Some good reasons would be because it is our character, it is our nature, it just flows out of us. We love to be a blessing to others and to show kindness to them and to do good for them. And then there's a t there are times when we do good to others simply because we love them. There are particular people that we have chosen to bless and to love, and we delight to do that. For instance, I love my wife, and I love to bless her and to do good to her simply because she's my wife, and I bless her in ways that I don't try to bless anybody else. It's a particular expression of love and goodness. Why do you do the good things that you do? Second question, is it your character to be a blessing to others? Does it naturally flow out of you? People who know you well, would they say that you are the kind of person who is regularly expressing love and kindness to others? Now, I ask those rhetorically, and I can feel the weight of conviction sweeping across the room, so I'll quickly move on to the third question, which is, why does God do good to people? Why does he bless people? And of course, the answer to that question biblically is, it is indeed part of his character. It flows out of him. It's, it's part of who he is as God. As we continue with our survey of the themes of Ephesians, I want to begin tonight by reading to you verses 3 through 14 of chapter 1. And as I read, I want you to mark in your Bible, or take a mental note of every expression of God's kindness or the good intentions of, of his will. Why does he love people? Why does he do good? And note how many different ways this is stated in these verses. So please listen as I read. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. In all wisdom and insight, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory." In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. 
Did you catch them all? Did you see the repeated statements of God's grace and kind intention? One of the most important passages in the Old Testament, in my opinion, dealing with God's character, and one of my favorite passages in the Old Testament, is found in Exodus chapters 33 and 34. You're probably familiar with the story leading up to that passage. It's when God has made Israel a special promise and entered into a special relationship with them where he said, I will make you my own people, a holy people, a royal priesthood, my own possession. And he's entered into a covenant with them where he said, here's my law. And if you will keep my law, I will bless you like I've never blessed anyone before. I will pour out lavish gifts upon you and I will protect you from your enemies and so on. And the covenant that he made, of course, is the Ten Commandments, where God says to them, first of all, I want you to have no other gods. And secondly, no graven images. And on and on through the Ten Commandments. Then he calls Moses up on the mountain to write these Ten Commandments on those two tablets of stone. And he is to take those tablets, and they will form the covenant documents. And while Moses is on the top of the mountain receiving these, the people are down in the valley throwing a party. And they're engaging in revelry and debauchery and all kinds of sinful things, climaxing in the creation of a golden calf. And they bow down before the golden calf, and they say, this is Yahweh, your God, O Israel, who delivered you from Egypt. And so as Moses is receiving the Ten Commandments, they are breaking number one and number two right there before the ink on the contract is dry, as, as we would say. And God says to Moses, you better get down there because the people have done a great sin. So Moses goes back down there, and sure enough, they're doing all this, and he calls people to trust God, or rather to obey God. Who cares about God, he says? Who has a passion here for God's righteousness? And the Levites come to him, and he says, take your sword and go, every one of you, and kill the evil brothers of yours. And 3,000 men were executed on that day for their sin. Well, Moses realized what's going on here. They've broken the covenant already, and God's wrath is now rioting upon Israel. And he says, you've done a wicked thing, but I'm going to go up to God and see if maybe he will provide atonement for your sin. And he goes to God, and he begs and pleads for God's mercy. And God doesn't exactly answer him the way he wants it. He said, on the day that I punish, I will punish those who sinned against me. But go ahead, lead them, and I'll send you out. Well, Moses realizes what God has just said is, I'm not going with you. You go, because if I go, God says, I'll end up destroying the people along the way. So you take them. And Moses and God kind of have this back and forth. And Moses says, you know, they're really your people. And God says, no, they're your people. And Moses says, no, they're your people. Back and forth they go. And finally, God says, I will go with you. Go. And Moses is feeling pretty good here. He's feeling pretty brave because God has sort of responded well to a couple of his requests. So then he says this. I pray you, show me your glory. Do you realize what Moses is asking there? Now, this is Moses who met with God face to face, the scripture says. But he realizes when he meets God in the tabernacle, he's not seeing the full God. He's not seeing the unveiled essence of who God is. And he says, God, if I have really found favor in your sight, if you're really pleased with me as you say, show me your glory. That is a pretty big request. Here's how God responds. I myself will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face for no man can see my face and live. Then the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me and you shall stand there on the rock and it will come about while my glory is passing by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I've passed by. Then I will take my hand away and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. He's going to get a partial answer to this request. But what I, what I want to draw your attention to is what Moses asks for and what God says he will do. The request is, show me your glory. And God says, I will show you my goodness 
and my graciousness and my compassion. Show me your glory. God says, I will show you my goodness, my grace, and my compassion. Now, if you're Moses, you might be tempted to say, I want to see all that. That's all great, but I want to see your glory. I want to see your essence. I want to see all that you are. God says, you want to see my glory? We're going to talk goodness, grace, and compassion. Well, the time comes. In chapter 34, verse 5, the Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him as he called upon the name of the Lord. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed. Now, let me remind you, when Moses said, show me your glory, God said, I will proclaim the name of the Lord. Show me your glory, God. God says, I'll show you my goodness, my great compassion, and I will proclaim my name. Here's what God proclaims to Moses when he passes by in his glory. The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps his loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Now, don't miss what just happened. Moses wants to see the resplendence of God, and God says, here it is, Moses. I'm gracious. I'm kind. I'm slow to anger, and I forgive the sins of people. The correlation here couldn't be clearer. God's glory is revealed in those characters, characteristics. This is who God is. We see this throughout the scripture. Of course, you know in the New Testament where the scripture says God is love. Not that God loves, although of course he does, but God is love. It's who he is. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul is getting at in Ephesians chapter 1 in these verses 3 through 14. You may know, if you've studied any Greek, that this in the original language is all one sentence. Talk about a run-on sentence. Verses 3 through 14 are all one in the, in the Greek. There's no period in there anywhere. And if you know Paul's writings, you know that usually he starts off with a greeting, grace to you and peace and so on, and then he gets to a, a, a statement of thanksgiving or gratitude. Well, he does thank the Lord for them, but he first embarks on this, what's called a Jewish barakah. It's a special blessing kind of prayer where Moses, or Paul has obviously been pondering and thinking about the grace and the compassion of God. And as he's writing to the Ephesians, before he gets to anything else, he has to state in this long running sentence of God's great grace and mercy and kindness. That's what's going on here, and let's look at a few of these. Back in verse 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us. Now, I know as soon as the word predestined or chose shows up, Instantly, your mind goes to the debate, because that's about all we do with this doctrine around here or anywhere else is debate it. It's not fair. Is it fair? Is that what it means? And all those things. I'm not going to debate with you tonight. I'm going to assume that you're going to take Paul at his words when he says he chose you and predestined you. And I want you to understand the implications of that. The motivation, he says, is God's love. I talked to a man a couple of years ago. In fact, it had been a long conversation over several years, and he was one of those who liked to debate this with me because he was not persuaded that God is the one who makes the choice of who gets saved. And so we had this running dialogue, and he was a very gracious man, and he would read every book I asked him to read, and he would have very good conversations with me, but he still was not convinced. One day, though, something grabbed a hold of him, and he called me on the phone, 
and we were talking, and he began to kind of go down this path, oh, what if, and what if, what if this were true? What are the implications of this being true? And in this particular conversation, he wasn't arguing with me as much as he was kind of pondering out loud and wanting to see how I would respond. And at the culmination of this discussion, he said, if this doctrine of predestination is what you say it is, and his voice cracked, and he choked up, and he said, why me? And I said to him, you finally get it. That's the whole point. Why anybody? Why would he choose anybody? Paul tells us. It's in love. He chooses to love us. It says we are predestined to adoption as sons. You realize what the scripture says. We were all born into a family, not God's family. We were, we were all born into Satan's family. We're called children of the devil. Disobeying, following the prince of the power of the air, Paul goes on to say in this letter. Doing our own thing, running away from God. And God looks out at this family, which is a wicked, evil family, and he says, I'm going to love some of them. And if you are a Christian here tonight, beloved, Paul is saying, he chose you. He loved you. He decided he wanted you in his family. Why? Because you're really great? Because you're just so wonderful? No. Because he decided to love you. Remember he said to Moses, I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. I will pick who I'm going to be compassionate toward. Before the foundation of the world, Paul says, he decided to have compassion on you. Why? Not because you're better than other people. Not because you're better looking than other people. Not because you're smarter than other people. Because he chose to love you. He's a God of love. He chose us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will. Don't miss that. God is a kind God. He takes delight to be gracious and loving to us. To the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us. At my home, one of the things that Krista and I do regularly is to command our children to love one another. Be kind to one another. Stop insulting one another. Stop picking on one another. Stop hitting one another. Be loving. Be kind. Be gracious. Be considerate. On and on it goes. And if you have kids in your home, I'm sure you know what that's like. In our home, kindness and grace and love is a command. They do it because they are compelled to. If they don't, there are consequences. So sometimes my kids show love to one another and grace to one another not freely, but because it's the law of dad. God's love is not that way. Now, we don't want our kids to stay in that place. Obviously, we're working to, to shepherd their hearts so that someday they will love out of a desire to just be loving. But with God, there is no one outside of him saying, God, you need to be nice to some people. God, you need to love some people, or else there are consequences if you don't. You need to be gracious and reach out to some people, or else I will punish you. Nobody does that with God. The only thing controlling and constraining God's grace is his own character. He is a gracious God. He loves to do it. He freely bestows on you his grace and his kindness. Nobody makes him do it. It's all his free choice. You want to talk about free will? God has it. His, his will is freer than your will. And he freely chooses to love us. Going on, he says, in the beloved. He freely bestowed on us in the beloved. And he goes on to describe all of this. That he has given us forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. You see how he repeatedly amplifies this? God has an abundance. He is the richest man in the universe in terms of grace, and he lavishes it on it. What's the opposite of lavish? 
little. God's not doling out grace. He's not stingy and miserly with his grace. He's not saying, I'll give you a little bit. He's pouring it out in droves in Christ by forgiving our sins, by purchasing our redemption. Why? Because he's a gracious God. The kind intention of his purpose, on and on. And all of this, Paul says, is in the beloved. He's talking, of course, about Jesus Christ. He pours out his grace to us in Christ, through Christ, by the work of Christ. How do you know God loves you? How do you know his lavish, his grace is lavished upon you? How do you know that he, out of his storehouse and his abundance, he has freely bestowed his grace on you? You look to Christ. Is there any greater evidence? If you were following with me in Exodus, you know that I stopped in the middle of a sentence. As God is revealing his character to Moses, and he says, I'm slow to anger, and I forgive, and I'm gracious, he goes on to say, I also punish sin. I will not, not let the guilty go unpunished. I will visit the sins of evildoers on them. To the, to the nth degree, he says. And yet, God desired to show us love and grace and mercy. How can he do that? We're evil people. In the beloved. He sends his son, his pure, innocent son, and he takes that pure, innocent son and he puts on him our sin and pours out his wrath and his justice and his holy character on his own son. And in that moment on the cross, when Jesus <laughs> cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? for the first time in all eternity in a way that is simply incomprehensible to us, God the Father was not with God the Son. And he gave him everything we deserve for our, our evil. And Paul says, you don't need to look anywhere else to be absolutely convinced of the lavish grace and love of God in that he would kill his son on your behalf. It's in Christ that we see God's greatest example of love. There is a connection even with Christ and God's glory and his grace. Do you remember when John begins his gospel and he's describing Jesus? And we have those famous first couple of verses, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the, was, the word was God, and so on. And then we go down to verse 14, and he says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of what? Grace. John says, When we beheld the Son of God, the word made flesh, when we beheld his glory, glory, what did we see? Grace. Full of grace. How do we see God's glory? Well, of course, we see it in creation. We see it in his justice. But what the scripture takes great pains to get us to see is the grandest expression of God's glory is the grace he has shown us in his son, Jesus Christ. We need to see that. We need to catch that. We need to get that. And when we do, there's only one right response. Did you notice in the passage, one phrase repeated three times. Verse 6, to the praise of the glory of God his grace. Verse 12, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. And verse 14, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. 
to the degree that we do, do not understand and grasp God's love and grace, to that degree we fail to respond the way we should. And that's robbing God of his glory. We need to be a people who look to Christ, who believe this is the grandest expression of God's love for us, and who when we look at Christ, we decide we are going to live today and tomorrow and the next day with one primary purpose, to praise the glorious grace of God. May we be a people who understand his grace and proclaim his glory.